OK, um, so I'm just going to continue. So now, now what I want to do is to consider, instead of considering a single layer of the 1 over m Laughlin state and putting them adjacent to each other, I'm going to consider two layers of the 1 over m Laughlin state. OK, so now I have, I'm considering two layers, and then I'm putting this trench uh, to separate them. So if I have two layers, now I have sort of two edge modes going in the right direction over here. This is like 1 over m, 1 over m. It's two, two layers of the 1 over m Laughlin state. And here also, two layers. So I have two edge modes going in this direction, and then two edge modes going in this direction. So now, uh, just following the discussion previously, I could add in this kind of interlayer tunneling. Well, so let me write, name the modes. I have four modes, phi right one, phi right two, phi left one, and phi left two. So now I could add this term cosine of phi right one plus left one plus cosine of m phi right 2 plus phi L2. Okay, this is the simple generalization of the term that I added before. And what's, that's going to heal the top layer into the top layer and the bottom layer into the bottom layer. Right? So heal in the sense that I discussed uh, a few minutes ago. Right? What the healing does is that it gaps out the edge modes, condenses quasi-particle, quasi-hole pairs across the trench, and then allows quasi-particles to coherently propagate across that bridge that's been created at the trench. So now this term, if it's dominant, if it gaps out the modes, will do the same thing, but now in both layers. But actually, there's another kind of tunneling term that I can add once I have two layers, which is a little bit more complicated, which is now I in tunnel the right mover from the first layer into the left mover, but of the second layer. Okay, instead of the first layer over here. <coughs> so this is another way that I could gap out the modes. But now what this does is that it heals the top fluid into the bottom fluid. And then it heals the bottom fluid to the top fluid over here. So it effectively will create this sort of branch structure where when a quasi-particle from the top layer is going to the trench, it coherently continues across the trench into the bottom layer. And from the bottom layer, it coherently continues across the trench into the top layer. Okay. This is actually a weird thing if you think about it, because it's like I've created a situation where two quantum fluids are crossing each other. And it's not like when a quasi-particle impinges on the trench, there is an amplitude for going into the bottom and going to the, rock, to the top. If it's happening at low enough energy, it will always go into the top. It's, the top is really glued completely to the bottom and vice versa. Yes? Um, well, so, okay, you might ask physically, how can I get both of these terms in a, like, a real system? And then, um, well, then that's a more complicated discussion. It is possible, actually, you can, I'm not going to get into exactly how you make this, but it's possible to sort of have this kind of situation. So all I need to do is find a way of generating these two terms. So through the second term, it would be more effective if closer together, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I, quantum mechanically, I can create this sort of perfect sheeted structure, which is perfect in the sense that quasi-particles from the bottom will always wind up as quasi-particles in the top and vice versa. Something that classically would never happen. And classically, and not only would not happen classically, it also wouldn't happen for the integer states. This is a, this is a bit of a subtle point. And I probably won't be able to expound on it too much. But if, if these were integer quantum Hall states, and I send in an uh, 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 electron from one layer, it could wind up as a superposition of electrons in the two layers. Whereas in these fractional states, if I send in a quasi-particle from the top layer, there is no way it can end up as a superposition of quasi-particles in the two layers. It will always end up in one layer or the other. So this fractional state allows the possibility of really making a, this complete 
twist where all the quasi-particles from the top layer wind up into the bottom layer. And it, it wouldn't be possible for the integer states. Okay, so that's about as much I'm going to say about that until, unless someone really wants more of an explanation. No, no, no. Um, um, well, you the I guess one hint is you can make superpositions of integer quantum Hall states in the sense that. C up could be an integer quantum Hall state. C down could be an integer quantum Hall state. And if they're both in integer quantum Hall states, suppose that both of these are in integer quantum Hall states, then it's also true that C up plus C down and C up minus C down are also both in integer quantum Hall states. However, if C up is in a 1 over M fractional quantum Hall state and C down is in a 1 over M fractional quantum Hall state, it's not the case that C up plus C down is in a single 1 over M fractional quantum Hall state, and C up minus C down is in a single 1 over M fractional quantum Hall state. That's sort of the, well, actually the essence of the matter at some, well, one aspect of it. Well, the first statement is obvious. If I have, um, if I have two Landau levels which are fully filled, then I can always take a superposition of the single particle states. And in that basis, all of the states are also fully filled. So that first statement that if these two are in a filled integer quantum Hall state, then in this basis, they're also in filled integer quantum Hall states. That statement is obvious. Now, if I put this one into C up into a fraction, fractional quantum Hall state, and C down into a fractional quantum Hall state, then it's, it's not true that I can just view the fractional quant view it instead as a fractional quantum Hall state in this basis. It's sort of a difference between this, um, this many in, intrinsically many body state versus what's intrinsically really a single particle state. That's, that's one heart of the difference. Okay. All right, so to analyze the difference between these two, um, let's consider a having a domain wall. So let me call this layer one, layer two, layer one, layer two. And the first tunneling is tunneling layer one to layer one and layer two to layer two. And then I'm going to have a domain wall and then I'm going to have the twisted tunneling where one tunnels to two and, and then two tunnels to one over here like this. Okay. So now I have this sort of, if I view the sort of you know, from a slightly different cartoon, and I create a bunch of these domain walls, I have regions where the two sheets are connected to each other, and then regions where the different layers are connected, and then regions where the same layers are connected to each other. Okay. But now if you look at this picture, what you'll, from, based on what I said in the first part of my talk, you should try to want to start drawing Wilson loop operators around these things. Once I create these defects, now I have a Wilson loop operators which can go all the way around the, de the defects. So I have this Wilson loop operator. Let's call this loop alpha. It's in the top layer. And so let's, so it's, we're going to index it by 1 comma 0, which means that there's a quasi-particle of type of the basic quasi-particle of the top layer is going around this loop. Okay. Now there's another Wilson loop, which is also allowed now, which is this Wilson loop which is a quasi-particle from the top layer, goes, hits this cut that I've created, and now coherently propagates into the bottom layer. So now this is 0, 1. Okay, and the fact that I've glued the edge states in this twisted fashion allows this to, to happen. So now I'm going to call this loop beta. So I have two quasi-particle, two Wilson loops, W of alpha and W beta. And I'm going to label these by, say, 1, 0, and 1, 0, which tells me where, where, what layer they start off their lives in. So you know, based on what I've told you in the first part of the talk, you should believe me when I say that the Hamiltonian of the system will commute with this Wilson line. 
in the low energy effective theory, the Hamiltonian is just zero. So this is kind of a trivial statement. And this Wilson line also has a non-trivial algebra. You see, there's a, there's a crossing point here. So when I interchange the order of this crossing, so let's say it's going like this. So if I, if I, if I have a, this kind of crossing, and I want to compare that to this kind of crossing, well, this is where the mutual statistics comes in. There's a phase factor here, which is e to the 2 pi i over m in the fractional quantum Hall state. Yeah. One zero means that the this quasi, this part of the quasi particle the quasi particle this part of the Wilson line is a quasi particle in the top layer, and it's one means the quasi particles remember were labeled by L from zero to m minus one, and so this is the L equals one version of the quasi particle. It's the uh, it's the basic the charge E over m quasi particle, and it's in the top layer. So this is the layer index, and 1 versus 2 versus 3 and so on is the, what charge it carries, what fractional charge it carries. OK, so because of this fractional mutual statistics, when I, when I want to compare these two processes, I'll see that, in fact, there's an e to the 2 pi i over m here. And the reason this is happening is because this crossing point, they're in different layers. So they're actually not crossing. They're only crossing here. If I just have a planar system and I draw two loops, there's two crossings, and these two crossings will cancel each other, and the loops will commute. But here, because there's only one crossing, the loops don't commute with each other. Nevertheless, they commute with the Hamiltonian. And so building on sort of intuition that we developed in the first part of the lecture, we know that there has to be m states in the system. And moreover, the, the operators which distinguish among the different states are these loop operators. So as long as these domain walls are very far apart from each other, these loops have to be very big. And so this is a, a non-local operator, which is distinguishing the different ground states. And so, lo so local operators won't be able to tell the difference between these different ground states. And thus, these, ground, these different M ground states are robust to local perturbations. The only sort of processes are processes where quasi-particle, quasi-hole pairs created. One of them tunnels all the way around this loop, and they re-annihilate. But this is a process which, uh, because this is a gapped system, this process is exponentially suppressed in the length of the loop. Okay. So. So if I had, say, 2n of these defects, then I would have n of these pairs of branch cuts. Now I can sort of do the same thing. I have, I'll draw all these loops. Um, let's see what I'll draw. So I'll draw this loop, and then I'll draw this loop, and so on. And then I can draw this loop. And so I can keep drawing these loops. And you'll find that here I have a pair of loops which intersects only once. Here I have a pair of loops which intersects only once. I can keep going. So, and if you count how many do I have, I have n minus 1 identical copies of that algebra over there, of, uh, of the algebra. And the copies are completely independent. You can see that these two loops have nothing to do with these two loops. So I have n minus 1 identical copies of this algebra. And that tells me that I have m to the n minus 1 topological states.
So if I wanted to think of these defects as sort of non-abelian quasi-particle type objects, I would associate what's So I would associate a quantum dimension of d equals square root of m for each of these defects. Yes? How do you know that you haven't forgotten I thought about this really hard. <laughs> uh, there are actually many ways of seeing computing this answer. And and I thought really hard about the loops. <laughs> um, so, so this is like a non-abelian defect with quantum dimension square root m. But you see, we started with just the Laughlin state. So the Laughlin state only had abelian quasi-particle excitations. None of the quasi-particles gave rise to topological degeneracies if we pin their locations. But here we've managed to create these certain types of defects where once we create those, we do get topological degeneracies. And we can think of each one as sort of a non-abelian point-like defect. It's not a quasi-particle anymore. It's some kind of extrinsic defect. And it has a quantum dimension of square root m. We could go further and we could compute the braiding of these non-abelian defects. So you can imagine braiding one of these around the other. It, given the construction that I've given you, it's a bit hard to imagine continuously moving one around the other. Um, but you, you could, from sort of an abstract point of view, you could just compute what that braiding process would give. And then you could find ways of physically realizing it. So I won't get into any of that. But there is a way of computing these braidings. And so these things have basically non-abelian braiding statistics. But they're not quasi-particles of the system. There's some extrinsic defect which we've inserted into the system by some clever way of playing around with the edge states. Yep. All right. So now I want to uh, discuss another aspect of these defects, which people have been calling uh, parafermion zero modes. So let's consider this defect that we've created. And um, let's imagine we create a quasi-particle, quasi-whole pair very close to the defect. Okay. So in this labeling scheme that I've introduced earlier, this is a, a 1, 0 quasi-particle. And this is a minus 1, 0 quasi-particle. Because they both live in the same layer. And one of them is a quasi-particle, one of them is a quasi-whole. And now I'm going to imagine the following situation where this quasi-particle goes to the left of this domain wall, somewhere far away. And then this one goes just slightly to the right of this defect. And then, but now it continues in the bottom layer. And then it ends up somewhere very far away as well. So far away, I have this quasi-particle, quasi-whole pair, but they're in different layers now. So if I were to label this, it would be 1 minus 1. OK. So what does this mean? This means that. So this quasi-particle is a topologically non-trivial quasi-particle. If far away from this defect, there's no local operator which could create it or annihilate it, right? Because it's a quasi-particle in one layer and a quasi-hole in the other layer. And quasi-particles can't tunnel between layers. Only electrons can tunnel between layers. So this is a non-trivial quasi-particle. But it can just be created for free at the location of this defect. Or vice versa, this quasi-particle could come, and it could just be absorbed at this defect. So you might want to say that this defect harbors a zero energy state for this quasi-particle. It has a zero mode for this quasi-particle. This is very similar to uh, Majorana zero modes in topological superconductors that we've heard a lot about over the last few days. If you were to take a Majorana zero mode and say these 1D wires that people were talking about, there's a Majorana here and a Majorana here. 
you could come in and you could inject an electron at zero energy over here. Yeah, there's a zero mode for the electron. Here, there's like a zero mode for this anion, this fractional quasiparticle. Now, we can, uh, we can represent this quasiparticle in the edge theory. So let me go back to my edge theory, which had these right movers and left movers. And let me consider this, this operator, um, which I'm going to call VL minus L, which is e to the i L phi right 1 minus phi right 2. So this is the operator in the edge theory which creates this quasi-particle quasi-hole, sorry, this quasi-particle quasi-hole pair, the 1 minus 1. Yes? Is there any sense that you need to Yes. Yeah, if I... If I want to put the system, say, on a closed manifold where there's no boundary, I'm always going to need an even number to be able to glue this side back up. Oh, okay. so if, you had a if you had a boundary, then yeah, the, the line could just go to the boundary and sort of end there. Okay. Yeah. Although then you might, you could just, you might be justified in saying there's also sort of a, something over here. OK, so let's write down this operator, which creates this quasi-particle quasi-hole pair in different layers. And here I've just chosen to put it on the right moving edge. I could have also chosen a similar operator, but on the left moving edge. So this operator, um, le let me think of this operator in a slightly different way, which is I'm going to think about this as the limit of epsilon goes to 0 of OK, let me introduce a little bit of the location of this defect. We're going to call x, xi. So, and this is going to be, say, vi at xi. So this is going to be e to the i l over 2 times phi left 1 plus phi right 1 um, at, let's see what I have here. Actually, OK. I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation. I have phi 1 minus phi 2 at xi e to the i l over 2 phi 1 tilde. Um, oh, this is xi minus epsilon. This is xi plus epsilon. And phi 1 is phi left 1 plus phi right 1. Phi 2 is phi left 2 plus phi right 2. Phi 1 tilde is uh, phi right 1 plus phi left 2. And phi 2 tilde is phi right 2 plus phi L1. OK, um, this, this it has the, if you just, this operator is exactly equal to this operator. But the reason I wrote it this way, uh, which is, there might be too, too much algebra for me to check for you on the board in real time. But the point is that now, if we look at that Hamiltonian over there for the edge modes, this operator, you can actually explicitly check, commutes with this edge, this edge Hamiltonian. V L minus L. Uh, R of xi is equal to 0. And the, the intuition is just that this operator, when you split it a little bit by epsilon, is it co coincides with the thing that's condensed on this side of the defect together with the thing that's condensed on this side of the defect. So that's why it doesn't actually change which minima the cosine terms are in. And so it doesn't change anything about the Hamiltonian just commutes with it. It keeps you in the zero energy subspace because it doesn't affect these cosine terms. Not only does it commute with the Hamiltonian, this operator, but it satisfies uh, an interesting algebra, which is that if you took, say, 1 minus 1 of xi and then define another one at, at another point xj, and you 
switch the order, there's a phase here, e to the 2 pi i over m times the sine of i minus j. So you can check this, uh, uh, these commutation relations. This algebra is called the ZM parafermion algebra. And this is the, so this is the origin of why these are called ZM parafermion zero modes. So there's this, the, this thing now, it commutes with the Hamiltonian, so it's a zero mode in that sense. And it has this algebra, so it's a ZM parafermion. But in physically, intuitively, what it is, is the fact that this quasi-particle can just disappear at the point of this defect or, not, or be created at this defect, okay? Now, okay, yeah, one, two more points. The case m equals two, this just becomes a minus sign and this just becomes the Majorana fermion case. And the other point is that these operators by themselves are not physical operators because they just create a quasi-particle quasi-whole pair. But that's not a, you can't just create a quasi-particle quasi-whole pair. It has, it, has to come from, it has to come from the vacuum. Or has, you can't create a quasi-particle quasi-whole pair in different layers by itself. So just like the Majorana fermion by itself is not a physical thing, you always need two of them to make an electron, to make something physical. Here, these operators by themselves are also not physical operators. You need to have, say, pairs of them from different points to create a physical operator. And in fact, pairs of zero modes from different points exactly coincide with these Wilson loop operators. So what's physical is always the Wilson loop operators. These zero mode operators are not physical, so Actually, initially, when people were talking about paraformin zero modes, I, was, I, did, I wasn't sure whether that's really a good name because these things are not physical in and them of themselves. But, okay, that's the name that stuck. Okay. Yes? So yes, the, exactly. The Vs are kind of like, you can, this actually is exactly right. You can think of, you can think of, say, the V that's here as this operator this endpoint, and the V from here would be like this operator. And so when you put the two of them together, you can sort of close up this loop, pull this one through, and then it becomes the Wilson loop. So yes, the parafermion zero mode operators are like the ends. They're like half, they're like half of the Wilson loop. Yeah. Okay. Um, So let me just mention a slightly more general situation. So suppose that we had these systems with K matrix M, N, N, M. So the double layer Laughlin state was an example of K matrix M, 0, 0, M. So it's two independent 1 over M Laughlin states. So now we can consider a slightly more general system, K matrix M, N, N, M. These are sometimes called Halperin fractional quantum Hall states instead of Laughlin because he's the one who discussed them first as in the context of generalizing the Laughlin states of single layer systems to double layer systems. So here you can do a similar thing. You can create these defects that couple the different layers. And again, if you want to find out what the quantum dimension of this uh, defect is, you should put, put in these Wilson lines, Wilson loop operators, and look at their commutation relation. But now you'll get a non-trivial phase factor from this interchanging these two, but you'll also get a non-trivial factor for interchanging these two because the off-diagonal term in the K-matrix will couple the two layers together. So if you have an off-diagonal term in the K-matrix, when you interchange uh, you know, something like this, if you interchange the, the order in which you do this, you'll, you'll also get a phase factor. Whereas if they were completely decoupled states, the two layers don't care about each other. 
So interchanging the order of the loops wouldn't, wouldn't matter. So in this case, you can go through exactly the same uh, procedure that I did before, and what you would find is a quantum dimension of m minus n. I could. I don't know if I was going to. Yeah, okay, I'll mention it. Uh, So, okay, what I've, what I've told you so far is, looks very uh, too theoretical and not physical. You could imagine trying to realize this. I won't say too much about this, um, but I'll just briefly show it to you. So you can take, imagine you took a, a double layer system where you had a 1 over m Laughlin state in each layer. Well, you could come in and you could cut this system with a gate. You could come in with a gate over here the gate will cause some electric potential, and it'll deplete the electrons below the gates. And now you'll have edge states, which go in opposite directions. Now, you can do the same thing in the bottom layer, at least in principle you can. If you're an experimentalist, you might require some work. Um, but now you can do the same thing in the bottom layer and deplete the electrons here. Okay, so now you would have edge modes here and here. And now, once we have these edge modes, you know, you can have electron tunneling between the different edge states. You could have this electron tunneling, you could have this electron tunneling, you could have this electron tunneling, and so on. So I'll call this T11, I'll call this T22, and I'll call this T12. So T11, if you have, if T11 and T22 are dominants, so say they're much larger than T12, then this tunneling is very large. And it's like, um, I erased it, but if you imagine my tunneling terms uh, that I wrote in these two layers, it's like having the tunnelings within the layer. Okay? It was the first set of cosine terms. But now I could imagine a, a different regime where now instead T12 is much, much larger than T11 and T22. So now these two modes have the strongest tunneling and they gap out. So then if that happens, this layer will be sort of, this layer will be coherently connected to that layer. And now I've managed to make one sheet, one sheet of this branch cut that I described for you. It turns out that making only half of it has essentially all the properties that I just described to you in the last 20 minutes. You don't need to make the other half. All of the properties are still follow. But just for fun, I, what I do want to tell you is that you can make the other half because you still have T22 and T11. And they're now the only modes that are gapless and left over. These modes have gapped out. So there's a sort of higher order you know, super exchange process where the electron can tunnel from here onto here virtually and then tunnel from here onto here. So there is actually a T21. You know, this tunneling is T21, which is proportional to T11, T22 over T one, two. So you actually do have both tunnelings in principle that you can think about. And both of these, if they're large enough, can gap out. This gaps out, you know, uh, phi r1 with phi l2. And this one could gap out phi l2 with phi right 1. So we've discussed an experimental proposal where to, in order to try to make this in a bilayer structure, we're not asking anyone to actually make the gap out this second pair, because that's more complicated. Um, but all the properties follow by just gapping this out. But I, I think it's pretty cool that you could also gap out this, this, these two modes. And it is possible to make this sort of structure where the two layers cross each other. It's not a, that's not something that's unphysical. Yeah, but well, as a theorist, you can. So, <laughs> yes, there, there are proposals to do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
So I want to give you another example of, of this, what we've discussed. And this is going to be now going back to the single layer system. So let's go back to the single layer, 1 over m. And remember, the electron tunneling term that we added in the single layer case was cosine of m phi left plus phi right. Okay, That was the electron. This was the term that was like c left dagger c right, the electron tunneling term across the trench. Now, why did I choose to have a plus sign here? I could imagine a situation where I put a minus sign there, phi L minus phi right. Now, this term will correspond to a term like c left dagger, c right dagger. So it breaks, breaks charge conservation. So in order to have this term, I better have like a superconductor nearby, like say a superconductor over here, which then I can think about this as Cooper pairs from the superconductor tunnel onto this pair of electrons in the fractional quantum hall trench. So it's like delta. Okay. So I, actually, I could consider both of these ways of gapping out the modes. So let's, let's focus on this one now. If this delta is large, then this argument will be pinned to a constant value in space. But that means now that e to the i phi left minus phi right acquires a non-zero expectation value. So before, remember, phi l plus phi right acquired a non-zero expectation value. And when that happened, that corresponded to quasi-particle, quasi-hole pairs across the trench condensing. But now, it's phi l minus phi right, which is acquiring a non-zero expectation value. So that means that now it's quasi-particle, quasi-particle pairs across the trench, which are condensing. These, right, so I have like a whole, whole pair, or quasi-particle, quasi-particle pair condensing across the trench. So this also gaps out the modes, and it glues the two fluids back together in some way. But it, it glues it together in a, a twisted fashion, because now, when a, say, a, elect, when a quasi particle comes in from this layer and it comes over to, the, to this trench, it sees a hole, it can recombine with the hole, and then it leaves behind a hole on the other side of the trench. So now, what this means is when a quasi particle comes to this trench, it sort of transmutes into a quasi hole. Here, in the original way of gapping out the modes with like the normal tunneling, a quasi-particle came through, and it stayed as a quasi-particle. You know? So the feature of this way of gapping out the edge modes is that it's gluing the two fluids back together, but it's gluing them together in such a way that when a quasi-particle goes to the trench, it gets flipped into a quasi-hole. It gets permuted into another type of anion, which is a different type of anion. Here, it stays the same. Okay. So now everything I told you in the last context, I could, in, in the context of the bilayer system, I could go through and analyze again in this kind of system. I'm going to, again, add these defects. I'm going to have a domain wall between the normal tunneling and the superconducting tunneling, the Cooper pairing. So this is, you should imagine this is all superconductor, really. And I could have another one here. You know, this is all superconductor. So now I could also draw Wilson loops. I could have a quasi-particle go around this pair of defects. Or I can have a quasi-particle go around this pair of defects. But then when it comes out the other side, it's actually a quasi-hole. OK. So, so now I have these two Wilson loop operators, w of alpha and w of beta. And again, I can calculate their commutation relations. So I can take, uh, you know, I change, interchange the order here between these two guys and then these two. And what you'll find if you work out the commutation relations here is that these also don't commute with each other. And in fact, there's a 2 pi i uh, times 2 over m. It, the 2 comes in because there's two crossings now. And this crossing is like a quasi-particle and a quasi-hole. And this crossing is a quasi-particle, quasi-particle. So while, rather than canceling out, norm, if these were both quasi-particle world lines, the phases would cancel. But now one of the world lines has flipped to quasi-hole. 
So now the phases add. So instead of being 2 pi over m minus 2 pi i over m and canceling, it's now 2 pi over m plus 2 pi i over m. So now I get 2 pi over 2m. So now what's the, by now we should be an expert in this. What is the dimension of the representation of these Wilson loops? Well, the number of ground states now, now it depends. If m is even, it's m, it's, uh, m over 2. And if m is odd, it's m. Okay. So again, you can consider uh, many of these uh, defects. And then you can ask, what's the quantum dimension of each individual defect? And you're going to find that it's either square root of m over 2 if m is even, or it's square root of m if m is odd. Yes. Exactly. Okay, so there's one subtlety in this superconductivity example, um, which I'm going to briefly mention, which is the following. Um, in the case where m is odd, if m is odd, um, then that means the system is made of fermions. If the system is made of fermions, then I could always imagine taking this system and adding a, this Kitayev 1D wire on top of it. Okay. And this sort of Wilson loop calculation that I've been doing, which depends on the bulk fractional statistics, doesn't know about whether there's a Kitayev 1D wire at this edge mode as well. So this Wilson loop calculation is really only sensitive to the part of the topological degeneracy which requires 2D fractional statistics. It's not sensitive to the part of the quantum dimension which could occur from just a completely one-dimensional system, which is sort of pasted on top of this system. So in fact, my calculation wasn't really complete enough. I can only tell you whether the quantum dimension of these defects are either square root m or square root of 2 times square root of m in the fermionic case. And which one of these it is, I need to do a more uh, a more sophisticated calculation using the edge theory, I'm not going to be able to know it just from this Wilson loop calculation. Yes? Because m, if m is odd. If m is odd, then, um, okay. If m is odd, remember I told you that the quasi particle that corresponds to charge m in the Chern Simons theory is tr that's a trivial object. But I also told you that the statistics of the quasi-particles is pi L squared over M. So if you look at the statistics of the charge M particle, it's pi times M. So if M is odd, that means I have a trivial excitation which has statistics of pi. So there's a trivial fermion in the theory. Okay. Yeah. OK. So in fact, if you go through this scenario of having 1 over m Laughlin on the two sides and consider domain walls between these two different types of gapping terms, the right answer, it turns out, is this answer. That's what a number of authors computed a couple of years ago. Um, but that, the, the square root 2 part of it is a completely sort of 1D, it's really 1D physics. And the square root m part of it its origin is this fraction, bulk fractional statistics, the commutation of the Wilson loops. Yes?
Um, sorry, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, one way that you could get rid of it is you could add in an, another pair of completely trivial modes on top of this, like phi l and phi r, and these are now trivial. They're described by like a k-matrix one minus one. And now, in addition to these two terms, I could also add like a cosine of phi l plus phi right here and a cosine of phi l minus phi right here. And then I would, and then this system will have an extra my, that, that's exactly like putting this Kitaev wire here and getting rid of it. Aside from doing this, I don't know of another way of uh, getting rid of this Majorana mode in a sort of solvable calculation. Okay, so now, now that I've told you this much, you can also probably easily infer what the parafermion zero modes are in this case. Now the, I have this situation. This is now a single layer system with superconductivity along this trench. And now you can see if I create a quasi-particle, quasi-whole pair, I take one of them to the left side and the other one to the right side through this branch cut, this one becomes a quasi-whole. Sorry, this one, it was a quasi-whole, it becomes a quasi-particle. So now I have this quasi-particle, double quasi-particle far away. So quasi-particles of charge 2n, where n is an integer, these are the quasi-particles which can just disappear at this domain wall or get created. And similarly to how I define the zero mode operator there, I could define a zero mode operator within the edge theory and show that it commutes with the Hamiltonian and has this parafermion algebra and so on. But physically, this is the zero mode in this case. Okay. So let me, uh, let me now back up. What do we have here? We, we had this system where we had a 1 over m Laughlin state here and a 1 over m Laughlin state here. Let's think about this system a little bit differently. Let's imagine folding this top part down under this, this one over here. So now I would have... Um, a one over a bilayer system where one of the layers is one over m and the other layers is, is minus one over m. It's minus because I I had to flip it over. So now the ed, the edge states are still going in opposite directions. It's just that the bulk of the other one is below this top layer. So it's one, one over m minus one over m. And so this is the vacuum. And this is my non-trivial fractional fluid that I have. And so what we've done here is we've found a way of gapping out these edge modes so that the boundary of this system is gapped. But what we found is that there are different ways of gapping out the edge modes. Okay, in one of the ways, if I take a quasi-particle from one of these layers and a quasi-hole from the other layer, when it hits the boundary, it disappears. That's the same thing as saying that a quasi-particle can go from here to here. Right? When I fold it over, it's like saying a quasi-particle, quasi-hole can just hit this boundary. So, okay, let me state this a little bit differently. A quasi-particle, a quasi-particle can go across this trench and become a quasi-particle here. Alternatively, if I reverse this arrow, a quasi-particle can go here and a hole can go here. And once they meet, they can annihilate at the boundary. So in this picture, What's happening is a quasi-particle, quasi-whole pair from the two layers, they can go to the boundary and then just disappear. Okay? What's happening at the other, when we gap out the edge modes with superconductivity, when a quasi-particle goes across and it becomes a quasi-whole. So this means that when a quasi-particle and a quasi-particle come together, they can disappear. And so at the other type of boundary, you know, a quasi-particle, quasi-particle pair from the two layers, they could go to the edge and just disappear. So what distinguishes one edge from the other is which quasi-particles disappear when they go to the boundary. Okay? And the fact that here on, on the normal tunneling side, it's only quasi-particle, quasi-whole pairs which can disappear when they hit the boundary. But quasi-particle, quasi-particle pairs cannot disappear when they hit the boundary 
if we've gapped out the system with normal tunneling. If we gap out the system with superconductivity, the situation is exactly reversed. So what we've, what we've found is that these two gapped boundaries, which are actually topologically distinct from each other because the domain walls between them carry exotic zero modes, give rise to topological degeneracies. Different topological classes of quasi-particles disappear at the boundaries. These are, so these are two topologically distinct gap boundaries. They are distinguished by which sets of quasi-particles uh, disappear at the boundary. And so, so in, sometimes we call these gapped boundaries line defects because it's like having a line defect in the system and when a quasi-particle passes through the line defect it gets permuted into another type of quasi-particle. So we have different types of line defects in these topological states like fractional quantum Hall states. And then what we found is that the domain walls between different line defects are these point-like defects which in many ways act like non-abelian partic particles. They carry exotic zero modes. They give rise to topological degeneracies. They have these non-trivial quantum dimensions and things like that. Okay. So the domain walls are, uh, you know, they localize exotic zero modes and so on. give topological degeneracies. And they are basically ways of engineering non-abelian-like objects in an abelian phase. Now actually, this statement that different gap boundaries are distinguished by which set of quasi-particles disappear at the boundary, you can actually generalize, I mean, you can generalize this statement and develop a full classification of different types of gapped boundaries in topological phases. Like, different types of uh, line defects, you might call them. And they're classified by some things called Lagrangian subgroups. And I won't say anything more about this. This is basically just formalizing the intuitive statement that you've just learned, which is that the question is, what quasi-particles disappear at that boundary? And the quasi-particles which are allowed to disappear at the boundary need to have certain properties. And the different sets of quasi-particles which satisfy these properties are called Lagrangian subgroups. So there's a, currently there is a classification of all possible distinct gapped boundaries of abelian topological phases. The case for non-abelian topological phases is still, still in progress, actually, at some level. OK. Um, I have like. Ten more minutes or something? Seven, eight, five, six? Seven. Okay, I want to give one other application of these ideas, which... <laughs> I want to give one other application of these ideas, which I find pretty exciting. And um, I'm going to discuss it in the context of Z2 spin liquids. So this is sometimes called the Z2 short range RVB state. Sometimes it's called the Z2 torque code. Sometimes it's called Z2 gauge theory. There are many names. So this, this state has four types. The K matrix here is 0, 2, 2, 0. It has four types of particles. There's the trivial particle. There's the what are called uh, E particles. And in a, in a spin liquid, these correspond to what are called either spin-ons, which carry spin 1 half and charge 0, or holons, which carry charge 1 and spin 0. These are the fractionalized objects in these states. There are things called M particles, which are they're sometimes called visons. And then there's the bound state of these two, EM. Okay? So if you go through what I've discussed in the fractional quantum Hall example, and then you apply it here, you'll actually find that there are, well, the, you really will find that there are three different states, or two, depends on exactly what your setup is. So what, what you can imagine is that um, 
there's going to be, well, I'll focus on the two different ones. You can imagine a gapped boundary where either m particles disappear at the boundary. So you can have an m edge where m particles disappear at the boundary. Or you can have an e edge where e particles disappear at the boundary. e disappears. So let's focus on a specific example where we're talking the, about the holon. We can consider a gapped boundary where the holon disappears when it hits the boundary. But the holon carries charge. So this can really only happen if we couple the system to a superconductor. So this is our Z2 spin liquid. This is a superconductor. But now, now holons, when they go to this edge, they can just disappear. Now this is a very interesting property because the electron is a combination of the holon, this is the holon, and the spin-on, which is spin-on, where this is a boson and this is a fermion. So if the, bos if the holon is, is, can disappear at this boundary, what it means is that the holon is condensed at the boundary. Is at the boundary. But that means that if I consider a term which is tunneling um, an electron from the superconductor, C superconductor, say spin alpha, into the spin liquid, spin beta, some matrix T alpha beta. When it, this electron is actually BF, but B is condensed at this boundary. So I can replace it by its expectation value. So what I find is a situation where I have C dagger superconductor F spin liquid. And what this means is that when an electron is coming in from the superconductor, it can just leave its charge in this holon condensate at the boundary and just coherently continue as the spin-on. So there's a direct one-to-one -one conversion between the electron and the fermionic spin-on. And this is a profound feature because normally, if you want to inject uh, something into the spin liquid, like suppose you were injecting the electron into the bulk of the spin liquid, it's going to split up into the, into the holon and the spin-on. It's going to decay into two excitations. And so normally, you would never have access to a single fractionalized excitation. You'll only have access to combinations of fractionalized excitations. But here, because the holon has condensed at the boundary, there's a direct conversion from the electron to this fermionic spin-on. And this direct conversion will allow you to, at least in principle, sort of directly probe features of fractionalization that you wouldn't be able to prove, probe if the boundary were just the M edge. Because at the M edge, you know, the, this holon is not condensed, and the electron, when it goes through and enters a spin liquid, will just split up into the boson, into the holon, and the spin-on. Okay. So this is an example of an application that I find very exciting, which is that the properties of these boundaries really give us a new window into probing, uh, you know, for example, in this case, coming up with possible measurements that could distinguish fractionalization in systems where it would be v it's very difficult to prove that you have fractionalization. So in this case, it's giving you access to fractionalized excitations. So I'll stop there. Well, if the holon and spinon are so strongly bound that you cannot separate them, like that's what occurs in a valence bond crystal, then, well, you don't have a spin liquid. So I'm talking about a situation where you have a quantum spin liquid. And in a quantum spin liquid, you can't, the, the holon and the spinon can be separated um, far apart from each other. So that's the pro almost at some level the defining property of these RVB states. Okay, that's a, that's a more more than one sentence. Okay. You'd you'd have to probe. So the fact that you can directly convert an electron to a spin-on gives you can start imagining possible experimental signatures for that, which would not occur if you didn't have this direct conversion. And so you can try to look for evidence of those signatures. 
you're going to use this as a way of knowing whether you have an MNT or DNT? Well, it's even, it's better than that. It's a way of knowing that you have a Z2 spin liquid to begin with. Uh, but if you have a DNT, even if you have a Z2 spin liquid, it won't work. That's right. So. If you see this signature, it'll tell you that you have an E edge and a Z2 spin liquid. If you don't see the signature that we would predict, it tells you that either you didn't make the E edge or it's not a Z2 spin liquid. Yeah. You have a 50% chance of getting it all. Right, right. right. Any other questions? Are those the only two edges possible? Okay, good. There's, um, there's also a bosonic spin on. Um, so, if the, the E particle you can think of as a bosonic spin-on, or a bos and bosonic, or um, a fermionic holon. So, actually, in the example that I gave you, this was a bosonic holon, and this was a fermionic spin-on. Now, here, you could, it's going to be reversed, because when you attach a vison to this, it changes its statistics. So the EM particles are bos bosonic spin-ons or fermionic holons. So I showed you how to condense the bosonic hol. I mean, I discussed condensing the bosonic holon, and I discussed condensing the M edge. You could also just condense the bosonic spin-on. And so that's actually yet another edge. So actually, technically, you have three edges. Um, but yeah, so yeah, technically there are three because these are the three different things you can condense.